Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Michael Fassbender, for being here with us. It's uh, an important moment for us because we've always taken at heart uh, within this festival uh, the importance of cinema as a way to underline the uh, unfairness and struggles that people can handle through their lives. And uh, we've been lucky enough to receive important people who fought for their rights and the rights of others, like Julian Assange a few years ago through Visio Conference, this year Angela Davis, who was in this room two days ago, and many other people who contributed in a way or another to, to fight for a better world. And this movie was broadcasted here, was shown here three years ago in the frame of a cycle which was called Resistance, which allowed us to show the work and in a form heroism of people who were struggling for, for their freedom and equality in countries as China, Algeria, Russia, France with their yellow jackets and many others. And today we're privileged enough to, to show it again and to have Michael Fassbender who has impersonated a crucial historical figure, Bobby Sands, um, who has marked the end of the 20th century to discuss about both how these struggles and the role of cin and how cinema can have an important role in representing these invisibilized um, fights and of course they're the importance of the of these struggles themselves and it is also important and maybe precious for us because we feel, and maybe you were wrong, but this is maybe the first question I would like to ask you, that your origins and the fact that you grew up in Ireland were not unlinked with the choice you made to, of course, uh, impersonate this person and more broadly to do all the efforts you had to go through to actually um, simply create this role. We, we know that you, you went through a severe diet and, and, and this is something that Hollywood often likes to spectacularize. We've seen that with, for example, Christian Bale over certain roles and others. And what we can feel through this movie is that maybe for you there was something more about, um, th there was something more than spectacle about doing this effort to actually incarnate this personage and this historical figure. So maybe my first question would like, what I would like to ask you is how, how did you personally get involved aside from cinema specifically with, with this story and how did, you actually, how did it actually play a role in, in the construction of the, of the character you, you incarnated? Hey, um, bon uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, well, my mum is from Northern Ireland, my dad's German, um, and so I was born in Germany and my parents wanted somewhere green and in the countryside to, to bring up their children because uh, we were living um, in Heidelberg and that sort of Rhine area of Germany is quite industrialised outside of Heidelberg and Ilvesheim actually, you know, where, where we lived. And so they were actually looking at Canada and Ireland, Southern Ireland. Um, and then they both got a position in a hotel down in Kerry's in Ireland. So that's where we ended up um, living. But all my Irish relatives um, are from the north, uh, north, north of Ireland. And so we moved to Ireland in 79 and I was two. And then whenever we had holidays, you know, whether it was Halloween, Christmas, you know, or summer, we, we would go and visit our, my, my mum's side of the family in Northern Ireland. And of course, you know, the troubles were very much alive through the 80s. So I, it was so prevalent to me how different it was once you came to the border 
uh, there was, you know, uh, Czech spot towers, soldiers with machine guns. We'd very often have to stop the car, get out. They would check the boot. And, um, well, actually, we didn't have to get out of the car, but they would go through the, the, the boot of the car, you know, make sure everything was, was above board, and then we'd enter into Northern Ireland, and it was like, you know, there would be bomb scares when you're going shopping, <laughs> and it was just a very dip different atmosphere and for me it was quite shocking but my cousins were living with it so for them it was like everyday life and it didn't really you you develop a certain dark sense of humor or a thick skin whatever you want to call it when you're living in a reality like that it becomes your norm and you do what you can to survive it uh, I know I'm not answering your question, but this is just sort of quite interesting because once, once peace did come to the north, you know, after the Good Friday Agreement, I think it was only the people that lived in Northern Ireland that realized exactly what they were living through because it was a war zone. So when I first got the script, I was quite nervous about dealing with that subject matter just out of respect for the people in Northern Ireland that lived through this period of time. And I didn't want to go in actually for the audition. And it was the casting director, Gary Davey, who called me up and he said, you have to come in for this. You're the right person for the role. And you have, you've got to meet this guy, Steve McQueen. You know, he's something really special. And I thought, of course, you know, what am I doing? I mean, at that point, you know, I was trying to get work as well. It wasn't like I was, you know, the offers were flooding in. It wasn't like I had a, a huge choice of things. It was just because the subject matter was so close to home for me in terms of, you know, dealing with the subject matter like that with the utmost respect. So I, I was like, absolutely, I'll go in and I'll meet um, Steve McQueen. So I went in and I met Steve McQueen. We sat down, we had a conversation and after that conversation, I was, I thought to myself, I have to work with this man. Um, he was just some, I knew that he was super special and a real artist. And I left very much charged up to go back and, and, and you know, and do an audition for him because that was just an, an initial meeting and conversation. Um, and Steve's didn't like me. <laughs> so I thought it went pretty well, the meeting. <laughs> but he was like, I don't like this guy, he's cocky. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and Gary Davey was like, no, please, you know, let him come back in. And now he was convincing him to see me again. He said, let him come back in and read. I really think this is the right guy. And, and so I went back in and I had really prepared, you know, the, the, the priest scene as much as I could in the time that I had available to me before I had the recall. And I went in and I did the audition for that and they hired, you know, then Steve and I just became, you know, from that moment on we were, you know, immediately strong friends and, and big collaborators, you know, I, 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 I had no doubt about doing anything for him in terms of trust in in a director, and uh, it was uh, it changed my life. Obviously, I, I would like to bounce on that. Um, I mean, it is quite clear that the the the, the movie is very researched in much details. One of the final scenes shows the uh, entrance of Rosaline Sands, the mother of Bobby Sands, into the prison to to see for the last time um, his son. We, we go over a shot in which we can see Bobby Sands running into the, into the fields. We know that Bob, Bobby Sands grew up in the city, but that he was very keen to always go to the, to the countryside. And, and, and we know that Rosaline Sain, Sands, sorry, I hope I pronounce it well, Rosaline, yeah. Rosa, uh, was a key figure for him, not only because he, he was his mother, which, but uh, he, he, he apologized to her in a letter 
for making her go through what she would go through because of his political engagement while he was in prison. She took publicly uh, a stance the day before he started his hunger strike uh, in Belfast, uh, which was quite of kind of an opening. So we can feel that all these elements are known by Steve McQueen and, and underlyingly nourish the movie. And the question I would like to ask you, as an actor in this movie and more broadly, do you rely on the research that the director does, or do you yourself invest you very deeply into the character by looking by yourself? I mean, do you consider that you have to know everything yourself, or do you consider you need to be guided? Is it a mixture of both? How did you feel in this relationship with Steve McQueen regarding this subject, which of course you knew from, a, from your personal history also? Yeah, I think, you know, some actors, everyone has, has, has different ways of, of you're creating an illusion that hopefully is something that the audience um, embrace and go on a journey with. And so different actors have different ways of doing that. Uh, you know, there, I will always do a lot of work myself personally um, at home. Uh, but when things really get to a very special level when you sort of rise above what you're capable of doing, you need a collaborator and obviously the director is the artist, you know, they have the vision and you're there to facilitate it. Um, so when you have somebody like Steve who's definitely, you know, prodding you and very suggestive in his notes, never really giving you a direct note, but definitely guiding you in certain directions and, and, and provoking certain things in you at certain moments in time when there's a vulnerability there or whatever it may be to try and draw something out that's unexpected. That's when things are really quite, you know, when you find those magic moments. Uh, I did as much research. I mean, I was, you know, terrified taking on a character like this um, because of, you know, whole history of, of what he went through and, you know, and how he is revered in, in areas of, of the north and then on the other side is uh, the opposite. Uh, but the commitment that he had and the ten men that, you know, that, that died in the hunger strike, you know, there, obviously there's an enormous pressure to do justice to the story. So I did as, as much research as I could and I came up with the, the thing that really helped me the most was the comms, which were the communications that the um, prisoners would send to one another. But Big McFarlane was second in command because they had that military system within the prison where Bobby was the commanding officer and then Big McFarlane was his right-hand man, the one below him. So he would take over as commanding officer once Bobby went into um, the hunger strike. Uh, the 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 messages that they would send one another were were fascinating for me to read, to get inside the psychology and the, the humor that they had in such circumstance and the frankness and the intelligence and the way they spoke to one another. So it was important for me to speak to Bick McFarlane. And so I got an opportunity to do that. And then really just working with the script at the end of the day, what's the story that's being told is, is in that section on the script and what you have available to you that you're going to translate to the audience and hopefully hold some sort of mirror up to the audience. Uh, then it was just a lot of work on the script. And so I remember I, before we started, I had learnt off the scene between the priests, you know, before we, we got, you know, started. I, I went up to Northern Ireland, I think, four or five weeks earlier than I needed to be, and I just, you know, soaking up the environment there and just working on the script, you know, day after day, you know, it's, and I, I, wanted to, I wanted to learn it, the whole piece off. Um, and then Steve was like, I want to shoot it in one. And I remember Liam Cunningham turned up to the first, his first day when he arrived. And he was like, and Steve was like, I want to shoot this in a one -er. And Liam always says that he looked over at me and I was like, <laughs> 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 uh, 
And he was shitting it, obviously, because we were 10 days out from filming that scene. So we were standing outside having a cigarette. I smoked back then, don't anymore. But, um, and he was like, what the fuck? You know, we got, he wants to do this in one. He said, what are we going to do? And I was like, well, I've learned it off. You know? And he was like, you bastard. <laughs> and, and, um, and I said, look, I, I, I've got a, an apartment. Uh, it's got two bedrooms. Nobody's using the, the other room. Why don't you just move in with me? And for the next 10 days, we'll hit it every day. And so we did, got up in the morning, made some porridge. And then we started to do the scene and we had a target that we would do the scene 10 times a day at least. So when one person was feeling a little lazy, the other would make sure that uh, we got back on it, we read it, we, we'd have uh, lunch delivered to us and we just spent the whole day and then Steve would come and watch what we'd done at the end of the day, give us notes and then we'd do the same thing the next day. And it was fantastic, that experience, the two of us together. Um, it, it felt like theater in a way that, you know, you take the onus on yourself for the responsibility and just work together as a team. Because there was only the two of us, obviously, on screen in that scene, and we needed to be there for one another to catch each other if, if one of us dropped the ball. And that was an exceptional experience. We became very close, and then when we shot it on the day, Steve then told the producers that he wanted to do it in one. I remember there was a big argument, and they all went off to the corner, and you could see Steve's hands going in the air. And, and he, we finished early that day. We went home early for lunch, I remember, because we shot the scene five times maximum. And, um, and he was like, well, I think that's it. You know, We should all go home. We did. Uh, but there was a fantastic energy when we shot that scene because it's not only you know Liam and myself that you're thinking, God, if we miss a line here or we you know we drop the ball, the whole thing we got to start right at the beginning again. But it's also the guy holding the boom. I remember there was the guy he was holding the boom mic, and I was like, you know, you're going to be in trouble. And we 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 had it timed in between when the trains were leaving Belfast to go to Dublin, Euston Station. So we had the train timetable because time we were shooting it right next to the train station. We were going to shoot it originally in the Mays prison itself, but we went there and it was so heavy, the atmosphere, and it was derelict. And we were like, okay, it's not... It was such heavy material, we needed a safe place to do it as well for ourselves. So they reconstructed exactly how it was in the Mays prison. And we were in... Um, like a, not a YMCA hall, but something like that. Uh, the Mayfield Center, that's right. And, and so the boom guy, I remember it was on the third take that I just saw somebody drop to their knees. <laughs> uh, it was on the right of me, I just saw somebody go boof. And, and he couldn't hold it anymore, but he didn't let go, so he's, uh, he was down on the ground like that. He's like, and I'm like, so it, it was an incredible electric atmosphere in there because obviously the focus puller, everybody's got to be, you know, really dialed in and focused. And we were all focused in, in, in the one aim and the one objective. It was pretty powerful. Does Steve McQueen uh, require you to, to be extremely precise on the wording? On, on the, uh, or or do, does he, did he leave you some space to reinterpret the text or to, to drift a bit aside? We didn't, we didn't do that because the text was so good. And when I first saw the text, I didn't really understand it when I first had the first reading. But as I worked on the text more and more, it really began to reveal itself. And it was so well written, we didn't dare to start, you know, improvising around it. And there was a rhythm to it. And there was connectors to each of the sections of the piece that we just respected. And we, that, that's why, you know, doing it 10 days in a row, 10 times a day, we just kind of, you go a little crazy with it because you, you know it and then you keep going and you keep going and you get it to a place where um, each connector is necessary. So we didn't go off script at all, actually. We, we stuck to it pretty religiously. We know the question of visibility was, was key to the, to the movement um, and to the IRA, and in particular to the prisoners uh, in their search for recognition for their stat political status. We know that the hunger strike started because uh, the blanket 
uh, movement blanket, uh, which which was a way to obtain this political uh, status, had not reached the public sphere, and the prisoners had spent years naked and in catastrophic sanitary situation yeah. without obtaining any result. And the, the importance of this movie relies also on the fact of making it visible once again, decades after it happened, and allowing new generations to understand what happened and how universal this struggle was. So we know the importance of your relationship with Steve McQueen first in your career, the importance of these movies you have done with him, Hunger, Shame, and then 12 Years a Slave, have had. We know the huge international repercussion it has had to allow to visibilize this struggle. What about the impact it had? I mean, the impact you feared uh, in Ireland, both Northern Ireland and, and, and Ireland. I remember I was quite worried at the time that it would just get a fair viewing because I remember a film came out some years before by Ken Loach, which is an excellent film, The Wind That Shakes the Barley. And there was a lot of um, resistance to it, even before I think people had seen it. Um, because I guess, you know, Irish history maybe wasn't taught in the British curriculum. You know, they were probably learning about you know, the American Revolution or various, th or the British Empire abroad or certain perspectives of what the British Empire meant. But I don't think a lot of people realize the history of Britain and Ireland going back, you know, uh, to the beginning of the century. And then, of course, the, the, the treaty that was signed in 1921 and the division of the country where it all came from. You know, people were just getting bombed on the mainland in England. And of course, they were frightened. They were confused. They didn't understand. Um, so when things really started to mount up in the late 70s and, uh, and uh, through the 80s, I think, you know, people in the, main, in, in, um, in the UK, i.e. England, were, were just scared. And they didn't really have a perspective of what the history is and where this was coming from. Um, I for sure felt a massive responsibility to just facil facilitate the story. And, you know, there's no easy answers to these kind of conflicts. So that's why I think, you know, Steve represented it very well. You know, the prison guards, obviously, there's a massive hatred between um, those prisoners and the national movement that, 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 that were in the maze and, and, and the prison officers themselves, a lot of them died, as we know from, from the film. But you have that um, character that Stuart Graham plays, you know, that you can see he's traumatized by what he's doing as well and how he feels like he needs to survive in that environment. So it's complicated. I mean, there's no... War is dirty, you know, and on both sides it, it gets dirty. And what happened in the prison wasn't necessarily a straightforward thing. It became the political, you know, point of the spear, but it wasn't really intentional from the movement outside the prison. It just happened, you know. So the prisoners wanted five things. They wanted to be able to wear their own clothing, to not have to t partake in prison work, um, to be able to receive parcels from their family or the outside, uh, to be able to um, allow their own educational studies and their culture, and to be able to mingle amongst their comrades. That's what they wanted. And essentially, it was political status within a prison that they were seen as soldiers, not criminals. And so they started off with the refusal to wear the, the, the prison uniform. And then, as you said, you know, that wasn't making a lot of headway and, and a lot of people on the outside weren't really sitting up and paying attention to it. So then they started the dirty protests, which meant that they refused to, you know, they, they obviously, they spread their ex excrement on, on the walls and tried to push the urine out underneath the, the doors to try and escalate the, the, the situation again 
for people on the outside to take notice. And again, not much coverage or there wasn't much support from the outside and so then they decided to go on the hunger strike. And the first one, of course, they thought they were getting a deal. It wasn't the deal that they had agreed on. It was a compromise deal. So then they went again with the next 10. You know, Bobby started that to basically get awareness on the outside. And now all of a sudden, the Republican national movement, the spearhead of it was coming from inside the prisons, but nobody on the outside really expected that either. We know hunger strikes were a tool for um, for Irish resistance uh, for a long time, and and that the the, the struggle that Bobby Sands tried to, I mean, the struggle that Bobby, Bobby Sands em embodied was inscribed in a long culture of resistance that were nurtured, that was nurtured generation after generation. And and my question to you as an actor is. How do you get in such a role and then get out? I mean, do you, do you, does it transform you and does it stick to you in a certain way and creates things that were not there beforehand? Or? Well, I think, you know, the process of, of losing the weight was definitely a very um, enlightening, enlightening experience. Um, just because the world that we live in now, everything is so readily available. And, you know, it's, the choice is sort of, you know, overwhelming what you can eat and how much you eat. And so when I started the, the diet, it, it, you know, I realized very quickly there were certain things that I needed to do, primarily, you know, be on my own from 7 p.m. onwards, because I would get quite grumpy in the evening. And, uh, you know, if people come around at 7 in the evening, usually, you know, they're eating chips or, you know. And uh, I was starving. <laughs> and um, But I, you know, the, I remember the first three weeks was really difficult because I couldn't sleep, because, you know, your brain and your body is, is telling you, you know, you need to eat something, you need to eat something. And so you, you're awake at night. And then after a while, the body and the brain realizes that this is what we're dealing with. And it just sort of streamlines. And then I felt like really, you know, I got, you know, a lot, quite sort of euphoric highs. And I was super focused. And it made me just appreciate a lot of things more um, when you take that away f from yourself. Um, I realized, you know, simple things became really valuable. But of course, then I started eating again, you forget. <laughs> um, uh, but the, the, the experience, like for me, this film is definitely the closest to my heart out of all the work that I've done for several reasons. You know, one, because it was a story that was close to my culture and my history. And I felt very um, privileged to be able to tell that story. Then, of course, meeting Steve McQueen, who changed my life professionally, and we became really close friends to, till today. Um, and I learned so much from him. And then that experience of, of going on the diet for 10 weeks um, was, was a very profound experience as well. So it was, it was and, and the one take, doing something like that, you know, that's a lot of the times with filming, especially on bigger things, you kind of feel like you're not earning your worth because there's so many different angles. You, they chop a scene up, you might only do, you know, a page a day or something like that of dialogue. In this case, we were doing 27 pages straight. And, um, and that requires some focus and a certain amount of skill. And it's, it's fun, it's challenging. And it's interesting because it's a huge moment of dialogue, but most of the movie relies on the absence of discourse. And, and we know yeah. that, uh, I mean, this is something I wanted to ask you when you read the script. I mean, we know that Bobby Sands was a prolific writer. He was a poet. He was also a singer. And that his influence in prisons was mainly the result of his capacity to, I mean, I think the word is completely wrong, but to entertain his fellow prison, prison mates and, and to nourish them with his poetry, with his, and that more broadly, the coherence of the group uh, of the political prisoners was relying on, on, 
on, on, on stories they will tell each other, learning. I mean, there was this, I don't know how, how the English wording is, but there was this theory in IRA of learning and escaping, or which was the two missions that political prisoners had when, when they got in. And, and he learned Gaelic in, in prison, which wasn't... The, so the, the whole relationship to discourse was central. And, to, and, to, and, and, and this is not obliterated, but there is this silence in most uh, of the scenes. And is it something that you discussed with Steve McQueen after reading the script? Were you wondering about this? Did he explicit the reasons of his choice? I think it's quite a sensory experience, you know, because you, at the beginning you're watching conditions and it's how do you survive in situations like that which seem unbearable and i think that's something that we see from text from let's say world war 1 the trench humor you know how you know cuz how do you survive you you need to keep yourselves occupied as much as possible during the day, so that if that means, I think, you know, people that probably survive in prison in general, the best are the ones that immerse themselves in something. And you try and occupy the day with as much activity as you can. Um, but for them, it was about, you know, keeping a strength um, in dire conditions to not be broken. But for, I think, Steve, and this is really a question for him, and I, I, I would only sort of guess, but the fact that you have something where you're observing images for a certain amount of time, and now you just have, blah, you know, this barrage of, of dialogue between the priest and Bobby Sands, and you really have to listen. And because the camera doesn't cut, and because you're stuck, it creates a sort of electricity and attention where you are really focused on what people are saying. And then immediately after that, you have the scene where the guy is, you're like, he's not gonna, he's not gonna wash that piss down the corridor, the whole corridor. And then halfway you're like, no, he's gonna go the whole way. He's gonna go all the way down the corridor. And that, you know, again, is allowing you to process this 23 minute scene where you just have this dialogue which has been absent pretty much for that first section of the film. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a sensory experience, for me anyway. You know, when you, you look at inside the prison, it's almost like you can get the smell of what it must have been like, you know, to sleep on mattresses that were soaked in urine and maggots in, in the cell, you know, the conditions, the smell, you become used to it. And to have that sensory sort of observation and perhaps get the smells of it, and then now you, your ears are open because this dialogue happens and you're awake to it and you want to hear it, you're thirsty for it because it's been absent. One of the subjects of, of the movie is uh, discipline, both from and two different kinds of discipline, from, from the political prisoners and from the guardians of prison. And it's interesting because it seems, to, I don't know if this is something that you felt already on the set or that you discovered once you saw the movie. And that's also a question I would like to ask you about how you felt when you finally saw this movie and, how, and when you saw yourself depicted uh, and, and in this condition. But the, the previous question would, would be, did you feel that he was creating some kind of mise en abîme in the sense that he, was, he had a very rigid way structure of filming with very rigid frames which themselves kind of echoed this disciplinary opposition between from one side the guardians who were pushed to do inhuman things through through a mixture of routine and of regulations that would just bring them to 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 avoid uh, being confronted to their feelings apart from some characters that we see breaking breaking aside and on the other hand the elaboration of a discipline as it goes by Bobby Sands, we can see him at some point thinking of what he should do once he's given these, for example, civilian uh, clothes. You, you can feel that he's not, he doesn't know immediately. He has to adapt himself to this new configuration and, and make a decision. And we can see all these bodies which remain still of the other political prisoners as if they were w waiting for him to end up elaborating an answer to his 
uh, new sanction. Yeah, you know, Steve is, is on, on his sets, he, he demands a lot from everyone. And you better come prepared um, because he knows that once the day is over, you don't get the day back, especially when you're shooting films that you don't have a, you know, a great deal of money to make the film. So time is precious, film is precious, and we shot it on film. And he just, he's like f fully energized during the day and looking for anything that's happening accidentally or, you know, mm -hmm. um, planned. But usually, you know, I think, you know, Steve is, is looking for those sort of happy accidents for sure, I think. And you've got to be so focused and try and like, you know, not leave any stone unturned. But, uh, you know, inevitably you always, well, I find, you know, I'm on my way home, I get around the corner and you're like, shit, I should have done it like that, you know. So you're trying to eliminate that as much as possible. And I think he saw in us, I think actually the first night we went out together with Steve, we all got really drunk and um, Steve lost his script in a bar <laughs> with all his notes. <laughs> And it, it, was, it was out in Belfast somewhere. We never got it back. And um, he was so upset the next day. And I remember Liam and I were in the back of the car. We were kind of giggling like schoolboys. And, um, and I think maybe he was a little concerned at that point <laughs> about whether he had the right guys. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, we were so disciplined about how we went about it. We took upon our, ourselves to take this time and rehearse. You know, nobody told us to do that. So everybody, you know, knew that we, there was a huge responsibility in what we were trying to undertake. So there was so much respect for that. And the discipline, certainly on everybody across the board, the person that was building, you know, the art department, hair and makeup, you know, uh, the, the director of photography, um, Sean, you know, they're, they're these everybody you could see had an intensity in their faces, and when they came to work, they, you know, everybody was totally focused. So it wasn't a question. And I think in, it's just a fraction of, you know, the discipline that the guys had in the prison that were trying to, you know, stay above water, not drown, and nobody's taking any notice on the outside really about what's happening in there and they're living in these crazy dire conditions trying to fight for their cause and make their point and so they needed to be ironclad in their philosophies and what they were doing and why they were doing it you know to go all the way 66 days of not eating and everything that happens to your body when you start when your organs, you know, your body starts to eat your organs and the pain that, that they were going through and the sounds that were coming from the infirmary, from some of the, um, the prisoners that were really struggling and, and, and in a lot of pain and you're hearing those screams and you're on the same journey and you know you're the next one in line. You know, I, I, can only, I can't even imagine so a line of discipline and steadfastness in what you're doing, I think there's no way you could do it otherwise. And it's considered that, I mean, there was some knowledge that he would die from, from Bobby Sands from the beginning, that, I mean, the journey he was taking, not only, not only because he knew that the, the British power was unwilling to concede anything, but also because he was the first of several people, he was leading a yes. movement, so naturally he would be falling. Uh, uh, was it something that you incorporated in your acting? So, or did you try to nuance it? Well, you know, definitely. I remember I went out to a pub with when I met Big McFarlane and when I realized when I met him and when I met, obviously, and I knew it was, it was going to be that way, people that were actually in the prison with Bobby. And, you know, they looked up to him so much. I mean, he's become such a mythical figure, but the people that were in the prison with him, and he led the way and as commanding officer. And like you said, he was such an inspiration as a poet, a songwriter, on so many different levels for the people in the prison and outside what he represented. 
they couldn't really look at me, you know. Um, and I asked some questions to Bick and he didn't really answer me. And then he called me later and he said, look, I realized I didn't really give you justice in terms of the questions you were asking. Would you like to meet up again and, and, and discuss? And I said, absolutely. So I remember I drove up to um, the Sinn Féin offices on the Antrim Road and I sat down with Bick there and we had cups of tea and I was in, you know, the room where the, you know, the, the board table was and the tricolor flag was hanging there and I was like, wow, some serious decisions were made in this room and you feel it. Um, but we just talked. I didn't want to probe too much. I just wanted to get a feel for, for him and, and, under, you know, and just have him tell stories to try and paint a picture of what I could sort of interpret Bobby to be like and how I would sort of try and um, find that spirit of a character. And, and then I remember we, he, he said, well, come down to this pub. We play here in this pub and you, you should come down. So we went down, we went to the pub and then I met some other guys that had been part of the movement and no longer were. And Liam, of course, was with me and we were having a conversation with this guy and he was like, this guy here is playing Bobby. And I remember the guy looked at me like this. He was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, so I wasn't feeling, you know, I was feeling pretty nervous, would be an understatement. And you know, that I wasn't like fully equipped as a person to take on this leadership role. But I knew that once we started filming, I had to have that presence for the actors and, uh, and the other guys in the cell block with me, I, I knew that it was so important that I had to carry that. But I, of course, you don't want to force something like that. I think you know, great leaders just have a way about them of, of caring for the ones around them more than trying to present an idea of I'm a strong person, as it were. So it, it, it just you know, finding that 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 balance was tricky and I, and I was super scared going into it, but it, it just comes then when you start working and you're on set and all the preparation you've done and all the work you've done leading up to it, and you, it starts to sort of take its own life. And was it uh, different for you to, to, watch, to watch the movie or once it was over compared to other movies you had participated in? Was it tougher? Was it... No, I, I felt... I felt so lucky, I felt relieved. I thought, I, I thought, well, look, whatever happens now in my career, at least I have this. Uh, and uh, I was like, you know, that, that's huge. And we were in Cannes, I remember, I, I was there with my parents and I watched it for the first time with them at Cannes. And I just felt proud and I felt, I was like, well, I'm lucky I've managed to get one of these films that I feel is, is one of the, the great films and I, I was lucky to be a part of it. And I was like, that's great. You know, if nothing else happens after here, I, I, I feel pretty satisfied. And is it in Ireland uh, a movie that, 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 that is considered to, to reflect a historical moment? Has it been a bit hidden because maybe it's not too explicitly political or judgmental or is it, has it become something as important as it is? Um, in the rest of the world? Do you know, actually? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think so. You know, I think um, it, was, it, it was a very true representation. And so I think it, it's, it's appreciated at home. But I don't know, it's, uh, you know, I don't check in with people when I go home. I was like, have you seen Hunger, by the way? And uh, <laughs> if not, why? You should watch it. Uh, you know. <laughs> I think the audience uh, might have questions. And I would like to open the floor, of course, to, to anyone who would like to ask Michael Fessbender some questions. You can ri raise your, your hands. So we have questions here. I don't know if there is a mic circulating. Good evening. 
Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, meeting you in person, Mrs. Fassbender. Um, earlier you said that you were very nervous when the, vo the casting director wanted you to play Bobby Sands in Hunger. Um, what, uh, that leads me to my question. What was your reaction when they wanted you to play a slave owner in 12 Years a Slave? I, I felt, um, again, very privileged. Um, <laughs> you know, the Solomon Northup story is, is such an important one and beautifully told. And so I just felt, again, a great honor to be part of the story and knowing that I had to play somebody like Epps, who is, you know, hard to understand. Um, I knew it was, again, you know, in, in such, you know, in the hands of Steve, it was going to be, we were going to approach it in exactly the right way. Uh, but I felt, you know, just a great privilege to be part of the story, even if I had to play the despicable character in it, you know, there has to be that. So I was just happy to serve the story. Yeah, this is why, uh, this is why I went to see this screening, because I find amusing seeing you portray two characters that are pretty much the polar opposite. Both uh, uh, Rob Bobby Sands and uh, Epstein Epps. And as a matter of fact, I think Hunger and 12 Years of Safe feel like two companion movies for each other because they complement so well uh, sending the, the messages of authority and violence towards minorities while uh, it plays under very different settings and while Ms. Vesbander plays very distinct characters from different sides of the spectrum. So, yeah, I have all, it's honestly quite amusing hearing your opinion about being cast as Bobby Sands whilst being cast as Epstein Epps. So yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good night. Hi. Um, according to the media, you live or have lived in Lisbon. And I'm curious to know if Portuguese movies, literature, art in general have influenced that decision or in the meantime that you've been living here or spending time here, if that is something that you have explored and if that is inspiring in your life? Not as much as I should have done. I mean, Alicia and I um, have done a couple of Zoom calls with the um, short film group that works out of Portugal. Um, and spoke to a lot of uh, young filmmakers that are starting off in the business. Um, but culturally, not as much as I should have done. I mean, the Tile Museum, I, I absolutely recommend. Uh, uh, and just basically the sort of the lifestyle here and the, the way that we can live here, the food, the people, um, the architecture, and just the nature, you know, has been something that uh, we've really loved, you know, living 20 years in London. And um, I was wanting to move out of London for, for quite a bit before I met Alicia. And I, kn I knew I wanted to stay in Europe um, because I love Europe and we both do. And, uh, and I wanted to be by the ocean. And it was a friend of mine, actually, an Irish friend of mine who... We were living in London Fields together in uh, uh, East London. Uh, he had said, I've just gone on over to Portugal. You know, you should check it out. It's like, it, it's, this is the way he described it to me, and I, I, I always describe it this way. He said, it's like a, a precious gem that's fallen down the back of the sofa and nobody knows it's there. <laughs> and um, and that's, that's the way I look at it. Um, we, we, we love it here. It's... Um, haven't looked back since we've made the move. Uh, we watched a war film together. Uh, I can't remember the name of it uh, quite recently. What was that one? Do you, do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, well, anyway. But sorry. I'm... <laughs> Hello, 
Hello, Michael. Hi. Uh, do you personally agree with Bobby's decision to go on strike and its consequences for everyone involved? It's a kind of impossible question to answer because, like I say, my life is so privileged. I think the generation that I'm a part of is so privileged. Just the fact that I could decide to be an actor and, you know, my parents' generation didn't really, you know, the idea of doing what you wanted in life was not something that you dared to even, you know, fantas fantasize about. And the situation in Northern Ireland in the 70s and what led young men to join the fight and join up with the IRA or whatever Republican factions they did join up with felt the need to do it. I know that when I sat down with, with one gentleman in particular, you know, because I tried to talk with as many that, as I could that were in the Mays prison, I looked at him and I was like, this guy's like a geography teacher, you know. What would these men have gone on to do if it, they weren't in a war zone, you know? Would they have gone off to be architects, lawyers, run a restaurant, work on a building site, all the normal things that we would think of doing once you leave school, whereas these guys were going to join up. And their lives were, a lot of them, destroyed. You know, there, you know the, the guys that I met that had, you know, in peacetime really kind of got hold of their lives were the ones that were constantly doing stuff within the community. There was a lot of them that were drinking the demons away. And you could see that the, the demons were close by them on their shoulder all the time. You know, it's, do I agree with what he did? I, I can't really answer it, but I absolutely respect it. And, you know, I'm kind of in awe of, uh, of, of such a, a, a uncompromising decision to use the only weapon that you have left in such a scenario, which is your own body, and to put it on the line and, and sacrifice it like that. Um, I, I have, you know, I, I just can't imagine doing it myself, so I have respect for it, but I can't, you know, do I agree with it? Like I said, you know, war is, it's, it's never a black and white situation, and certainly Northern Ireland is in the black and white situation. But the people that joined these different um, groups, nationalistic groups or loyalist groups, had the reasons that they had to do it and felt like it was their only option. And, and the nationalists and republicans will say that they just wanted equal rights. Um, I have to respect it, but I have never been in that position. So it's... It's hard for me to say, but for sure, you see the damage that war does and the implications and, and, and the people that survive, what they carry with them today is, you know, can be pretty horrific. Well, it is horrific. Uh, also, uh, did you experience any spiritual uh, experience when, when you were fasting to prepare for the movie? Yeah, absolutely. While I was preparing and while we were shooting, I remember I had real trouble shooting the scene when Bobby passes away. Uh, we were shooting and it's a supreme close-up and I don't know, was it the fact of letting go of this journey that I've been on, but I remember I struggled to get that shot right and I had to take a moment, regroup. I had a little um, green room area in the building. I had to go, you know, down to that room. And I, I, I remember I was in, you know, a feeling of, of quite distress and regrouped and went back up there and we shot it and, and, and we finished it. But it was definitely, like I say, for me, the reason why it, it's the film that I've done out of all of them that, that is closest to me and that I feel most proud of because of th this, you know, complete like journey that I made on it. The, the films you made with Steve McQueen, were they harder 
than any others to shake off afterwards? Sorry? Were they any harder to shake off? Shame was the hardest, I think. Yeah. That was pretty funny, because, you know, you think with hunger, but it felt like there was, there was a choice to use one's, one's body as a weapon to sort of find some sort of salvation in your scenario, in, in your situation, and to drive home a message that you feel very strongly about, whereas shame, you're a prisoner of your body. And to be suffering from an, an addiction, I think probably, and I did get to experience it, you know, of course, with the fast on hunger, I did feel for people that had eating disorders. Because I remember I was going and checking calorie counts and everything that I was eating. Mm. And I thought, my God, you know, this is a reality for a lot of people. And, and obviously, in order to survive in life, we need to eat. And obviously, another primal thing is to procreate. So sex addiction, to be imprisoned in that is a very disturbing thing. And having met uh, one guy who we kind of based the character of, of um, Brandon around was this gentleman that I, uh, I had discussions with. And, you know, that, that fear of intimacy, but the need to be intimate with many people as much as possible and to, and to like, be constantly craving it is such a, a complicated scenario to be in. Uh, and we shot it in five weeks. There was a lot to do, and it was pretty emotionally, you know, um, heavy. So that one was, was uh, uh, there was a darkness that stayed around for a while. But the other, the other parts, not so much. And, the, you know, the same, like I said, with, with doing Hunger and then again with the Epps character. I felt like I was serving a story and I could step away from it fairly easily. But, yes, yeah, shame was the one that really sort of hung around like a bad smell. <laughs> it was heavy. Can I just ask one quick follow-up? Sure. Is there any chance we're going to see you working with Steve McQueen any time in something he's doing very soon? I hope so. We've been talking about it. Um, so I think it will happen, yeah. Are we talking about Blitz? Huh? Blitz. Oh, uh, not on Blitz, no. But that's... Right. That's happening right now, I believe, so, no. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for being here presenting this beautiful film and the after as a film student was really impactful to me uh, and I, I just wanted to ask you if you think that you've worked in a in another film that you believe is as detailed nuanced and as sensorial and raw as this one is and also if you if you'd like to work in a film like this uh, again if you yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm always searching for something that will be so special. I think I was kind of spoiled, you know, working in a series of films around that period of time, but certainly, you know, the three films with Steve where you realize it's not, it's very unusual to have the opportunity to work on these sort of projects and to tell these sort of stories and to work with that collaboration of people. Making a film is so crazy because you can put a lot of great ingredients together but sometimes they just don't souffle <laughs> yeah. and, and it just collapses for whatever reason. Um, it's very interesting filming, you know, you become a family very quickly, especially on low budget films, you shoot like let's say five or six weeks, you've got to hit the ground running, that chemistry has to be there, and that goes across the whole crew, not just the relationships that you have with the actors, but everybody, and that's, it's, it's, it's like the alchemy of it is, is, is kind of hard to put a formula to. Uh, I, I don't think I would do something where I lo had to lose weight like that again. <laughs> I, I think it's a one-off, definitely does some damage. And, you know, I had a cut-off weight of 58 kilos, and that was the target. 
and I managed to make 58. But still, it, it, it took some time for the body to recover. Um, and that goes the same, you know, you talk about, you know, Christian Bale earlier. I mean, you know, hats off to that guy. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's yo-yoed so many times. It's so bad for you. I mean, it's so demanding and so damaging in the body. Um, so I don't think I would do that again. Or maybe, you know, you never know. But <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the scene that you did with the priest. Uh, was that your audition scene? Yeah, but I didn't have it all learned off, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was also curious how, how much time that took, and you already replied to that uh, in a very funny way. And then Jobs came along, right? That so Jobs was 2015, and something around there. Um, uh, some years later, we shot um, Hunger in 2007. And I think Jobs was when we met. Yeah, 2015, around around then. Uh, no, but what I Because I just I, we just met actually, and I just got the script and. Yeah, and it was, you know, 190 pages, um, and I was in all of those pages. <laughs> that and, was a, a And I'm really slow at learning lines. I am. I'm like really terrible at it. So I have to. I have to read a lot, and that was super pressure job. Actually, I felt a lot of pressure doing that one. But it was a preamble, so you thought that that was hard, but. Uh, later on, it was even harder, and you made it. And you I got an Oscar nomination about. out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Yeah. Um, I hope <laughs> uh, this performance made us, I think, me and us realize how much we miss you in, a big, in the big screen. Oh, and I know that you. we ha you have a couple of projects coming soon, so uh, I'll, I'm looking forward to seeing you in that. Thank you. Hopefully, also, I don't disappoint. <laughs> also, since Alicia is here, hello, Alicia, um, I would love for you to do more comedy because you're great in comedy. <laughs> so, um, how does one is able to portray so many different characters as you do? I mean, you've played Carl Jung, you've played Magneto, you've played Bobby Sands. You've played Steve Jobs. How do you manage to juggle that in your head? I've I've always loved um, the idea of, of trying to get uh, into different personalities by reflecting on my own um, personality and insecurities and desires and ego and whatever else it may be. I've Look, you know, uh, I, I also realize that I'm repeating myself in, in certain ways as well. There's only a, a, a certain amount that I am capable of doing. Like, I can't do a Romeo, you know. There's certain things that I am confined by, but within that range, I try to um, stretch it as much as possible. That's always been something that I've pushed myself to do to try and not repeat things. Um, and then just to go for it, you know, the, most of the times I'm not happy, you know, and I feel like I've definitely, uh, you know, gone below the bar of what I saw in my own head. You know, when I'm doing it, I'm like, wow, well, that's great. And then I watch it and I was like, geez, that's terrible. <laughs> um, and so, but, you know, to always be in that place of, of, not being sure whether you're gonna get it, and that the 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 fear and the risk, and just to, to to push it and to try and do things. There's so many jobs. When I, I get the job, I'm like yes, and I celebrate, and then I'm like oh god, you know, how am I gonna now, you know, bring this to life? And like for example, with the Steve Jobs. Uh, Film. I remember when we were in rehearsals and I was pouring coffee and I was thinking, I'm the only person that doesn't belong in this room. So, you know, it's, it's just doing things that I feel like I'm, 
on the edge of what I can do and not do and try and just work within that limitation as best as possible. Well, keep doing it. You're pretty good at it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I want to stress that it was a privilege to have you with us and a privilege to have you with us with this movie. I think the, 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 the words you had on discipline create this feeling of respect for the people who, who watch it. And, and I think it is why this movie has marked history and, and I think was justifying the, a turning point for, for a lot of people. So thank you again for, for having been with us. And, Thank you so much. Thank you.